My hotel room was booked in Yuma, Arizona. Not a place one would typically find themselves except in the instance it was for a new job. My employer put me up in a hotel for a few weeks until I was able to secure a place. The hotel was brand new with a very accommodating and kind staff. Most of the rooms appeared to be empty just because the place was that new. So they put me on the first floor in a corner room suite. My first week in the hotel, everything is quite normal. I watch TV till I fall asleep and I wake up and make my coffee in the morning with the supplied Starbucks wafer shaped coffee packet, open my two creams and two sugars and then I'm out the door for another day on the job. As with any new place, you meet coworkers and get invited to do some exploring around the area. My colleague tells me that there's an old ghost town about an hour's drive out from the hotel that he think I'd enjoy. So that weekend, on Sunday, I pack a small bag and I'm off with my new friend to have an adventure. After almost an hour's drive, we pull off onto an unpaved desert road. The dust is kicking up along with rocks and a tumbleweed. The rental car is taking a brunt of the abuse and it was in no way, shape, or form really capable of such a task. Finally, as we pulled in front of the entrance of the encampment, we had to sit and wait for all the dust we stirred up to settle. We opened the car doors and started trekking around looking at the old rusted cabins and displaced metal scrap. My colleague walks up ahead of me and he yells, Whoa man, there's mining holes, watch your step. I come up to where he's standing and I look down into the deep abyss of a hole. I can feel a steady stream of cool air rushing out of the hole that envelops around my face under the hot Yuma sun. Maybe we should drop something in it. See how deep it is, he says. He grabs a giant rock and throws it in the hole. We count in the seconds until we heard it hit. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi. Thunk. The feeling of letting something so heavy drop into a hole so deep reminded me when I was a kid. I was always so terrified to even peek over the edge of a high building or off the rail of a cruise ship because it felt like somehow I'd lose control of my ability to stay grounded and I'd fall over. The seconds felt like minutes and with the cool air from the hole whispering into our ears, I started to feel quite uncomfortable. Uh, do you want to check out the rest of the place? I asked while trying to seem nonchalant. Sure man, there's lots to check out, he said. As we started coming over a small hill, I was kicking up more dust and rock and scrap metal. Something came over me in an instant and I just didn't feel right. I stopped in my tracks and I looked over to my friend who was about 50 feet away from me on another path. He was staring right back at me, looking as if he had committed the most appalling act. You're standing in a makeshift cemetery. How'd you know that? I say to him as I look down at my feet. There's boots sticking out over there behind you and you're standing next to some sort of boulder that looks like a headstone. It became apparent that I was standing on top of an old miner's grave. My immediate reaction was to run and then jump in intervals to get without disturbing the area anymore. When I was nearly out of the cemetery, I sprinted and I tripped over something in the dirt. I looked down and it was a brown old boot that was ripped open, exposing the toes of a skeleton buried underneath. Being part Native American, I knew this was sacred ground and I had made a huge mistake. My grandfather would tell stories of our ancestors burial sites being disturbed by rowdy teenagers or unassuming loggers and labor workers. He would tell me the sorts of curses one could bring upon themselves having disturbed such a sight. Let's leave. I'm ready to go home now, I mumbled, clearly looking shaken. Uh, don't worry about it, man. You didn't know. It's not like they mind. They're dead. My friend tried to joke to ease my apparent tension. The drive home felt short. I could only keep obsessing about what I had done and the fact that I had tripped over a dead man's foot, how I saw his bones exposed and 
how I made it all worse by disturbing a site that probably hadn't been touched since it was abandoned in the 1800s. When I got into my room, I was utterly exhausted from the afternoon. I face planted under the bed and I slept for a solid 12 hours straight. When I woke, it was just past 2 a.m. I was completely awake after my long hard nap. The TV was still on as well as all the lights in the room. As I laid in bed, I felt like I was being watched. The hair on my neck and my forearm stood up. I felt the chill run down my spine and I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was staring at me from the other side of the room. Compelled, I reached into the nightstand drawer and I pulled out the Bible. The only thing I figured could give me a sense of peace. Until dawn, I read various verses out of the book out loud, almost shouting at points. However, the feeling of being watched persisted until it was time to get moving for work. Going through the motions of getting ready helped me some, but showering, dressing, and eating, I still felt like someone was staring right into my eyes. I ended up going to work and talking a little bit to my new friend about yesterday's adventure. I decided against telling him about last night's paranoia because I didn't want him to think I was a coward or that I was crazy. The workday passes slow and I start to feel quite exhausted from having such a bad sleep schedule the night before. I make it back to my room. All the lights are off, the TV is off, and I find that my bed isn't made. I have no new tiles in my coffee, cream and sugars haven't been replaced. That's odd. Maybe it was a fluke. The cleaning ladies might have just overlooked my room on accident, I thought to myself. Abruptly, I head to the front desk to check on why my room wasn't cleaned. The lady manning it is the manager. A middle-aged Latina woman who was born and raised here in Yuma. Hey Josh, what's up? How's your stay been? She asked. Oh, it's been great. Everyone has been great. But I wanted to ask you. My room wasn't clean today. Did the maids just forget? Oh, I'm so sorry. Hold on a second. What room are you in? 118. Hmm, I don't see any notes here. If you need any fresh tiles or toiletries, let me know and I'll have them delivered to your door. I'll make sure she does it tomorrow for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, not a huge deal, I was just curious. I'll take a towel, a pack of coffee, and that cream and sugar, please. Sounds good. I'll have them bring it to you. I walk back to my room and I decide to sit on the couch while I wait. The feeling comes back again. This time, I feel like I'm being watched, but also like I'm not wanted in the room. Uneasiness sets in and the chills come back running across my neck. I go for the side table and I pull out the Bible again. I begin to read it out loud. There's a banging on the door and I jump off the couch startled. Housekeeping. Upon opening the door, I see a nice black haired cleaning lady who hands me my stuff. Before I could say thanks, she turns around and promptly walks back down the hall. I see her gesturing with her hands, but only from the back. As I lay in bed, I end up nodding off with the Bible still in my hands. A loud thump in the bathroom wakes me up. I get up and wipe the drool from my face. I look over at the clock and it shows 12.22 a.m. Maybe the thump was a new neighbor next door. I quickly brush it off and I decide to browse the overly priced food options in the lobby. How's your night going, sir? I hear behind me. On edge I respond. Oh good, just looking for something to eat. I grab the box of tortellini, charge it to my room and then start heading back to my room. I insert the room key and I push open the door. The door doesn't open all the way. I try it again, closed it and put in the room key. The door is latched from the inside of the room. I peer through the opening and notice the lights are off inside the room and the TV is on. My heart sinks. I remember the lights are on and the TV wasn't. The TV is also angled towards the bed which I didn't do. I run back over to the front desk clerk. Hey man, uh, I think someone is in my room. I'm locked out from the inside and the TV is on with the lights off. Did you guys book that room for someone else? 
Looking confused, the clerk responded, No, there's no new check-ins today, and we have you booked in that room for a whole month. I'll call security. Security shows up with a tool to try and open the latch. He takes my keycard and slides it in, waiting for the green light. He turns the handle, and at the moment the door is stopped by the inside latch. The TV angles towards us through the crack and then shuts off. Nope, he says, and then turns around and walks away. Hey, what am I supposed to do? Is someone in my room? I yell. He didn't respond, and he never turned around to even acknowledge my question. I head back to the front desk while the security guard explains the situation. After a few moments of discussion, the front desk clerk calls the maintenance guy in. Back to the room we go. The maintenance guy tries working the latch so the door can open, and finally he gets it. The room is completely dark. The maintenance man turns to me and says, Can you ask for another room? I say, Why? All my stuff is in here. If no one is here, then maybe it was just a coincidence. He shrugs and inspects the latch. It's a brand new latch. You see how it clicks and it doesn't just freely swing? He tells me this as he attempts to slam the door and make the latch close on it. All attempts to make the latch swing shut on itself were futile. He looks at me with sympathetic eyes and suggests I just move to a new room. I decide against his recommendations and bed down for the night. The next day, I woke up feeling extremely lethargic due to all the suspense and activity of the night prior. I drudged through work and came back to my room, only to find that again. It hadn't been cleaned. As I open the door, I see two of the cleaning ladies walk past and motion the holy cross symbols and mumble in Spanish under their breath. Hey, so is anybody going to clean my room? The one lady scurries away leaving her companion. Yes sir, I'm sorry. We have one of the women who will do it. Why hasn't anybody done it yet? We all refuse to clean your room. I'm sorry. But why? There is something very evil in your room. It watches us when we clean. It's a devious spirit and it likes to play tricks. For a second I couldn't speak. I knew exactly how and why this happened. And now I have my very sensitive and superstitious Catholic cleaning ladies refusing to clean my room. You felt it too, I asked with a quivering voice. Yes, you should move rooms. The white lady said she will clean it. She isn't superstitious like us. Well, I'm not superstitious either, but it locked me out of my room. What is this thing and will it follow me or does it just want this room? I don't know. Have you done anything to upset a spirit? This room was fine before you came. Feeling accused, I respond. Oh, I don't know. I went to an old mining town with a friend and I accidentally walked into a cemetery. Adios mijo, she said under her breath and then gestures the sign of the cross. I have to go, sir. I'm sorry. After talking to the manager and explaining the events of the night prior along with the cleaning ladies refused to clean my room, they ended up giving me another room. I packed my stuff and I relocated to the third floor. I'll be fine here. Maybe it really was just the room, nothing to worry about, I said assuringly to myself. I kept all the lights on and the TV and I dozed off like a baby. I woke up sweating and confused. I heard giggles up and down the hallway. Damn it, annoying little kids, I yelled. Tap, tap, tap. Followed by a few giggles from what sounded like a little girl. Only this time, it came from inside my room. I laid there paralyzed. The room felt very cold. My arm hair started to raise up, but I couldn't move. My mind was awake. My eyes were open, but my body wouldn't budge. The TV on the mount turned towards the couch and then it shut off. The latch snapped into place and my desk side drawer opened up and a Bible got pulled out and thrown onto the ground. The pages started to shred out all over the room and I heard the giggle of a little girl. She laughed harder as she saw the look of terror on my face. My room phone started to ring but I couldn't get any strength to get up and answer it. The terror stopped. 
The pages all floated to the ground, but the phone kept ringing. I finally got the strength to control my body again, and I reached for the phone. Hello? I said. Hi, this is Dana from the front desk. You need to get out of your room and come down to the lobby immediately. She screamed into the phone. Without any hesitation, I hung up and I ran out the door towards the elevator as fast as I possibly could. The elevator door is open and I pushed first so rapidly and hard that I almost broke the button. When I got into the lobby, my friend from work was waiting for me. Hey man, are you okay? They said they heard screaming from your floor. Screaming? Maybe it was me. What about the little kids playing in the hallway? Did they see them on the security camera? Dana, the lady from the front desk, came over to us. We didn't see any kids on the camera, but we did get complaints from the floor below that they heard running. So what the fuck is going on here? You guys have spirits, the Bible, and the pages were being ripped up all over my room. The cleaning ladies wouldn't clean my room, and they kept making cross gestures and telling me an evil spirit lives in there with me. Sir, we have called the police to come have a look, but you need to stay here. Oh, trust me, I'll be right here in the lobby. After about 30 minutes, the officers finally showed up. They talked to Dana at the front desk as I see her pointing towards me. Alright guy, how much did you have to drink tonight? Looking confused, I responded. Uh, none officers. I haven't had anything to drink. Yeah, well, right. The nice lady at the front said she has you on security footage of you running up and down the hallway ripping pages out of a Bible laughing and giddy like a psychopath. I felt a wave of disbelief and confusion rush over me. I didn't. I couldn't have done that. I, I was laying in my bed and then everything started to go insane. Pages flying everywhere and I even heard the latch. I got locked inside. I was locked inside. The officers looked at me unimpressed with my story. Sure, buddy. Okay, we're just gonna take you down to the station and check you out. You're being detained. My friend stares at me like I'm absolutely crazy. As I pass by him in handcuffs, I see the two cleaning ladies. They gesture the cross and the one comes up to me. Next time you go on an adventure, know whose graves you stir. And then her eyes turn soulless and black as a devious grin swept across her face. She opened her left hand and small pieces of a Bible trickled out onto the ground. It's them, they did it. I yelled at my friend, pointing my head in the direction of the ladies. The cleaning ladies. The officers continued to restrain me with all their force. Josh, the staff said there's only one lady who works here right now. She's an old white lady. You've made this all up. My face turned pale and my body went limp. I'll never know the truth.